What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another Tesla video. In this one, we're going to be looking at a talk that Andrew Kirpathy did a few days ago. If you don't know who he is, he's the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Autopilot Vision at Tesla. Uh, his talk was really, really good. I condensed it down to the most important parts, uh, so you guys don't have to watch the whole thing. But I definitely recommend that you guys do. It is really, really in-depth and it is really cool. I will have a link to that in the description below. So, uh, with all that said, make sure you do like the video. Uh, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think. And make sure you guys subscribe for the latest and greatest Tesla content. Let's get going to this video summary. That we work on is the autopilot. So just a very brief introduction so that you understand a bit of the problem uh, domain and scope of the team. Uh, so the autopilot has already released uh, the kind of... Uh, basic version of it will do a lot of the lane keeping and it will actually and it will also keep a distance away from the vehicle in front of you. Uh, Navigate and Autopilot, which is this enhanced functionality that we've announced a year ago, uh, roughly, um, and is now in the hands of customers as well, will actually do a, a bit more on the highway. So in particular, if you can set a navigation point somewhere, um, somewhere in the world, it will navigate to it and Autopilot will automatically do all the lane changes and take all the right forks. And if there's someone slow in front of you, it will pass over them and so on, the enhanced summon. So what you can do is you can summon your car from your driveway or your parking spot and the car will come to find you uh, based on the GPS location. And so there's no one in that car, it will just come to you. And then you get in like royalty and it's <laughs> the best <laughs> when it works. Uh, but more broadly, <laughs> You may have seen other um, self-driving uh, vehicle companies actually demonstrate similar functionality, but what you have to realize is that even though they look the same, under the hood they are very, very different. So in particular, a lot of our competitors will um, actually take the approach of having LiDAR on the top of the vehicle, and the LiDAR will scan and pre-map all the environments in very high definition maps, and then when you're driving around you're perfectly localizing using your LiDAR to that map, and then you're driving that way. So for us, this looks very different because we don't have any high definition maps. We do not use LiDAR. We rely primarily on vision. So what we do have instead is we have eight cameras that are pointed in the 360 around the car and we obtain video streams from all those cameras and we parse them using neural networks and we stitch that up into a, a view of what's around us in three dimensions in 360. 97% uh, accuracy is not good enough. You actually really need a high 99.99% accuracy uh, for this to be, actual, to be actually safe to deploy this engine. Uh, so, uh, which is a process by which you iteratively build your data set. So you have a network that you've trained on some data set uh, V0, and then you train your network, deploy it, and you uh, have mechanisms by which you notice that the network is misbehaving or produces inaccuracies. And you sort, source those examples, annotate them correctly, and incorporate them into the training set, and you spin this data engine loop over and over to actually get this task to work really well. And we don't just do this for one task, we do this for many tasks. So let me try to go into how this gets very crazy very fast. And the core issue is that you, there's actually like a ton of things you might want to know about the environment if you're trying to drive. So as an example in this uh, random image of a residential neighborhood, you don't just want to know about the cars, but there's of course a ton of things you want to know. You want to know about the static objects, not just the moving objects. You want to know about the road signs and what they're telling you. You want to know about the overhead signs next to the traffic lights and they tell you about whether or not you can do a U-turn or anything like that. You want to know about the traffic lights and all their state and you have to handle all the variety of those traffic lights the lane lines which hint at the, the flow of traffic, the road markings that tell you what you can and can't do in any lane, the uh, curbs that tell you about where you may or may not want to move if you want to not damage your vehicle, uh, the crosswalks that hint at the behavior of pedestrians in the vicinity, and lots of environment tags as an example like, is it, are you in a residential neighborhood? Are you in a tunnel? Are you coming up to a toll booth? It just gives you a sense of, there's, there's about 50 or so tasks that we simultaneously work on in the team. And even though I've put only a single task here, says moving objects, there's actually lots of subtasks for moving objects because I want to know a ton about all those objects. Is it a pedestrian or a bicyclist or a motorcyclist, a pickup truck? Is it a truck? Is it a bus? All those things have repercussions on your driving policy and your expectations about how these things might move. We just have a single viewport, a viewpoint. We actually have eight cameras, as I mentioned. And all of those cameras, uh, as you might imagine, uh, are just different viewpoints, but they're all made, they all have cars. They all have potentially other objects like traffic lights and so on. And so you might imagine that you actually might want to share um, features across um, those different viewpoints. So for us, it looks a little bit like this potentially, where we might have some of the first layers that are shared across all the other viewpoints because all the viewpoints will have edges and T's and little wheel shapes and stuff like that. But then they start to split off later in the network and eventually on a per camera, you might actually split off all the different tasks. And so this is potentially what, what that network could look like. 
And then the other dimension to all of this, of course, is that not only do we have tasks that are per camera or per or use multiple cameras, but we have tasks that potentially could use uh, context across time. So you have to imagine taking this uh, beast of a network, stamping it out across time, and uh, if you're using something like a recurring neural net or something, you would be sharing features across the time dimension. Uh, but effectively, your network ends up looking maybe something like this. So as you might imagine, all these different tasks will kind of mathematically plug into the same final loss, and that's what's being backpropagated. A lot that goes also, also into some of the training dynamics of what makes this hard. So as an example, we are trying to get a traffic lights to, uh, to, uh, color to work well. If you are just naively sampling your data sets from the fleet, then you might find that most of the traffic lights will always have a red or a green color. And so it will be very unlikely for you to run into orange or, say, uh, blue <laughs> or something like that. Um, so you might be in a setting where you have a million red and green and you only have like 50,000 of orange or 10,000 of blue after you've tried really hard. And so what you do typically in that case is um, in academia what you'll see as standard is you might want to start to massage your batches. So it's not just about the task weights, but you can also uh, massage the batches and make sure that uh, you have some representation of all these rare classes tasks. because some of these tasks that I mentioned are much easier to train and train much faster. So as an example, the road markings task, we might only want to sample a batch of road markings every 10th cycle, but moving objects we might want to sample more often to train. And so we have a schedule for batches that is both on the level of tasks, but also inside a task, we have a schedule of batches. As I described, this is kind of a beast of a network. It multitasks so many things, and we have a finite team, and uh, this team is dispersed across the network and collaborating on this network at the same time. So maybe there's, we have this notion of a task owner. So someone is working on the moving objects, someone is working on static objects, someone is tuning on traffic lights and the architecture there. Someone is messing with the uh, loss function for traffic lights and two interns are working on the architecture on the bottom. <laughs> so just a few interesting uh, kind of things that have happened in the team. As an example, I walk around, that's me on the bottom left over there, and I say, hi traf uh, tra uh, traffic lights task owner, if you could make traffic lights work a bit better, that would be great. And uh, the traffic light, and there are many um, tips and tricks to actually getting your task, the one that you own and you want to work very well, to work well. So the traffic lights owner has an idea, and they go to the configuration file where you list all the different tasks. And as I mentioned, we have different oversampling ratios for different tasks. So you just go to the traffic lights, and you see your oversample is just one, so you make that two. And that means that your task will be trained more, <laughs> and that means your network will work better on your traffic lights task. And then you say, hey, can you prove my commit? And a random person says, okay, and moving objects person gets upset. What's going on here? <laughs> because their task will be starved of resources. I mean, the, the higher point being that there's finite capacity to go around, and a lot of people are trying to simultaneously get their, uh, their task to work well, uh, but uh, there are many uh, okay ways of doing that, and some of them are uh, cause political drama, I would say, in the team. So because you don't want to touch the full network, because everything is validated and, and signed off, you might have this idea that, okay, I will just, what I'll do, is I will just fine tune this little piece of this network and I will make this work uh, a bit better just by fine tuning that small piece. I'm not touching any of the t other tasks, nothing has to be revalidated and so on, and I'll just try to improve this in isolation. Uh, a person took a base model and fine tuned it, and then a different person took their model and fine tuned something else, and then someone fine tuned something on top of that, and then someone fine tuned something on the wrong base model, and now because the model has changed, so now there's a complicated chain of fine tunings that people have performed, and this, uh, this doesn't work. Uh, there. So it's very appealing to want to do this, but we found, for example, because of the workflow, uh, that you actually just can't, uh, you can't get away with that. It's not a good idea. Also, the, the most fascinating component to me is when you have networks that are being simultaneously worked on by 20 people, what does that look like? What, are the, uh, what is the etiquette? <laughs> and then what, um, what are the, the tips and tricks and rules of thumb for how to, how to work with these architectures so that uh, everything works? Okay, great, thank you.